Good morning and a warm welcome to the service this morning if you're watching online or if you're listening in by telephone. It's good to have you and it's good for us to come together to worship God. One or two intimations just before we begin and that's to say first of all that uh, there will be an evening service, our monthly gathering service is this evening and that should be coming online just before 6 o'clock uh, tonight. And uh, the teacher at that service is uh, Mr. Farrakhan McLeod, one of the elders here in the congregation. Also, let me just say it's possible uh, to listen to the services by telephone. I know uh, most people probably will listen online, but uh, some will have that opportunity. So uh, there's been the opportunity created to listen by telephone. And the number to phone is 01859 570 580. When you phone that number, you, you wait for 30, 35 seconds and then service should begin and uh, you can listen in that way. Uh, the Youth Fellowship uh, will meet online tonight as they did last Sunday night at the usual time, half past seven, and the leaders will be in touch with the wire uh, through the group chat. The prayer meeting this coming Wednesday, usual time, half past seven, uh, and we will hope to uh, connect through Zoom as we uh, did last Wednesday, and uh, there's details about how to do that on the on the Facebook page, which has been set up for this period. Uh, if you're not able to access the Facebook page and uh, want just to be given a, a, a guide through that, please feel free to phone me, uh, 0859 502 618, and I'll do my best to talk you through how to connect by telephone. And indeed, let me just say, please feel free to phone me uh, anytime about anything. It's a very strange thing being in the church uh, with only one other person operating a camera. Uh, it's, it's not easy that we're not able to be physically together, but uh, uh, let's take the chance uh, to, to keep in touch with each other however we can. And uh, you're very welcome to phone me at any time. These, I think, are all the, the notices. Uh, so let us begin this time of worship and let us worship God and sing to his praise we sing from Psalm 115 and we'll sing from verses 1 to verse 11. Not unto us, Lord, not to us, but do thy glory take, unto thy name, even for thy truth and for thy mercy's sake. O wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God now gone? But our God in the heavens is, what pleased them he hath done. Not God to us, Lord, not to us, but do thou glory take unto thy name, even for thy truth and for thy man. Like them, let me 
Uram és Félem Esté. A Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and for the opportunity that you give to us to come before you in prayer. We thank you for the promise in Scripture that we have that where even two people meet together uh, in prayer, then you are with us. And in this strange situation to us in many ways where only two of us are meeting in a building, we thank you that we have the assurance that you are with us. And yet we thank you also that as we anticipate coming together in different homes and uh, perhaps different times, gathered around your word and, and singing your praise, uh, we thank you that we are also able in that way to, to unite our hearts in prayer and, and draw near to the God who calls us to come to him. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who reveals yourself to us, and even in the psalm that uh, we have sung, we thank you that uh, you speak to us about who you are. You're the God who is glorious. You're the God who is majestic. And we only have to look out our windows and the beauty of Paris to see the majesty of your creation. We thank you that you're the God who is powerful, the God who is sovereign, who is in the heavens. And yet you're the one who does not remain aloof from us and distant. And that you come, come near to us in Christ. We thank you that Jesus uh, is, is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. We thank you that Jesus is the one who has shown us in, in full measure the reality of the fact that God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? We thank you for the, the love of God, for the mercy of God that uh, we hear of in the psalm and we are propelled forward into the New Testament to see in, in great fullness at the cross of Christ. And we thank you for Jesus who laid down his life so that we could be given life that is eternal. We thank you for your great love of us. We thank you that you're the God who, who cares for us. You're the God whom we are able to trust. And we pray that in these days which we uh, find so bizarre in so many ways, these days which unsettle us and which may make us at times fearful, we thank you that we can come to you. I know that you are in control, that you are sovereign, that you are trustworthy, and that you see all things, and that you are even working in the midst of these days to bring glory to your name and to bring things together in such a way that, uh, that your people know your blessing. So help us, Lord, we pray to trust you. Speak to us, we pray, through your word, and enable us to have ears to hear and eyes to see. Jesus. We pray for those who are listening and watching in different places and different situations. We pray for those who are struggling just now, for those who are sick, for those who are receiving treatment and who we need to know your healing touch and we bring them to you in prayer. And we ask, Lord, that you would be at work in their lives and where it's your will that you would bring healing. And Lord, we thank you that even where physical healing is not possible, your grace is sufficient to take us through each day that you have given us in this world. We pray for those who are feeling lonely, for those who are uh, very much feeling the, 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 the reality of isolation. And we ask that you would draw near to them in a special way, that you would minister to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for those who are elderly and who may be fearful as they hear reports and see uh, articles about uh, the, the, the dangers of contracting this virus at, at a particular age. And we, we ask that you would give to them peace and that you would give to them protection. We thank you that you are our help and that you are our shield. And we pray for our young people as well, for those who are not able to meet in Sunday school just now. And we ask that in their own homes, Lord, and as they open their own Bibles, we ask that you would speak to them and that they would remember you and that they would trust you in the days of their youth. We pray for those who you have put in authority over us, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would give to them wisdom. Uh, we keep praying, Lord, that uh, they would seek wisdom which comes from heaven. And as we 
wrestle with these difficult circumstances, we pray that they may know more and more of a sense of their own inadequacy. We pray that they would be humble, that we as a nation would be humble, and that we would look to the God who is able to heal, and look to the God who is able to help us, the one who is our ever-present helper, close at hand, in times of great need. We pray for those in the emergency service, for those who work in the NHS, we pray for those who are key workers, who we deliver vital goods, who keep shops open, all the, the, the things that we need to be able to live. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that there are those who are, who are continuing to work in these different uh, service industries, and we ask that you would bless them, and that you would equip them, and that you would strengthen them for the work that they are doing at this time. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would continue with us now, we ask for your help, we pray for the uh, sense of your Holy Spirit uh, here in this building and in every home where we come together. And we ask, Lord, that as we open your word, that you would speak to us through it, encourage us, uh, correct us, Lord, rebuke us, uh, speak into our lives with your word, which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Hear our prayers, take away our sin, Lord. We confess that we are sinners, who stray far from you, but we thank you that you are a God who is merciful, a God who is gracious, and a God who promises that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to purify us from all unrighteousness. So hear our prayers, continue with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, it's good to not see you today, but I hope you can see me on the other side of that screen. I uh, have one or two things to show you, and, and before I show you these things, I want you to think about this. Um, I want you to think about this and, and guess each of the things I show you. What do you think they're for? They're not the, the easiest things to figure, but the question is, what do you think these things are for? So I'll just come down. And uh, I'll show you it, and I'll give you five seconds or ten seconds maybe for each of them. You can shout out and guess uh, what these things are, and then I'll tell you what they are uh, just after that, okay? There's the first thing. Can you see that? Is that closer? You can see that it's a knife. But have a guess. What do you think it's for? Well, it's obviously not a knife for spreading your, your, your butter on your toast because it's too thin. It's not a knife for, for carving any kind of wood because it's, it's not very sharp. So what do you think it's for? Well, I'll show you what it's for. It's for opening letters. And opening letters nice and neatly. So there we go. That's the first thing. Here's the second one. What do you think that's for? It goes like that, snips about a bit. Take a second, have a think about it. What do you think this is for? I would never have guessed this, but this is actually for pulling out the little green bit on the top of a strawberry. I've always used my fingers. And I don't know why you wouldn't use your fingers, but somebody has thought it was a good idea to invent one of these things and uh, you can just snip hold of the top of the strawberry, pull it out, and I'm told it does an excellent job. Here's the third thing. Any idea what that is? Ian A, who's behind the camera, any ideas, Ian A? I haven't got a clue. Not a clue, not a clue. Looks a bit like a mini iron, although well, I don't think you any would know what a major iron was either. Uh, but uh, it's it's actually something that you, you hold like that. I should have brought an orange, but you, you, you jab the, the sharp bit into the orange and you push it under the skin and it peels an orange perfectly and it peels an orange without you getting any uh, sticky mess on your, on your fingers. So that's the thing. To look at these things at first... You would wonder, what on earth is that for? But once you realise what it's for, 
It all makes sense. And you think, oh, that's good. That's designed just for that purpose. One last thing to ask you about uh, what it's for. And and the last thing I wanted to to ask you about what's it it for is is this and and that. What are we for? And that's the the question. What's What's our reason for being here, boys and girls? And what should we what should we be doing with our lives? I think a lot of people are asking that question just now. Because, because we're realising as we take time at home that life isn't just about work. Because most of us aren't working. And life isn't just all about school and, and getting the best grades. Because, because there is no school just now. And uh, we've been told there's not going to be any exams. Life isn't all just about sport. Because we can't play any sport and even the best Sports people in the world just now, they've hung their boots up for a while. They can't play football because they're not allowed to. Life's not all about money because there's hardly any shops open for us to be able to, to spend money. So people are, are scratching their heads and they're thinking to themselves, what on earth is life for? So what do you think life is for? Well, I think you know the answer to that question because you've been thinking about that in Sunday school in your catechism. So let me ask you a question from the catechism and you can say it back to me. How and why did God create us? That's the question. How and why did God create us? What's the answer? Well, that's right. God created us, male and female, in his own image to glorify him. Another question that you've learned in your catechism, how can we glorify God? And the answer is by loving him and by obeying his commandments and law. So boys and girls, in this strange time when we're all a bit far apart from each other, it's good for us to know and it's good for us to remember that our purpose is to know God and to glorify God. And how can we do this? Well, we can do this by uh, by spending time with Him, reading the Bible, because this is where God speaks to us, and this is where God shows us who, who He is. We can spend time getting to know God as we uh, as we close our eyes and we put our hands together uh, and we speak to Him in prayer. And we can spend time getting to know God as we as we join together. Uh, with our families, as you're doing this now, uh, and worship them. Life can be so busy uh, for lots of time that, that, we, that we sometimes forget what life's all for. But no one's busy just now. We're all, we're all kind of still. And so in the stillness, boys and girls, let's pray that will come to know God better and that will glorify Him with our lives because that's what we're made for. So we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you made us. And we thank you that you made us so that we could know you, that we could trust you, so that we could know joy in our hearts when we spend time with you. And we thank you, Lord, that you made us so that we can glorify you. We pray that you would help us in our lives to to glorify you. Help us to to spend time with you. Uh, Help us, Lord, we pray, to to obey the things that you want us to do with our lives. And help us, we pray, to know uh, that you are close to us. And that we are safe when we are with you. So be with the boys and girls for wherever they are, and help them to know that you are close to them. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read God's Word now. We're going to read two Psalms. Two Psalms. Uh, Psalm 114 
and Psalm 115. Psalm 114 and Psalm 115. This is God's word. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of foreign tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it, O sea, that you fled, O Jordan, that you turned back, you mountains that you skipped like rams, you hills like lambs? Tremble, Lord, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. And now Psalm 115 from the beginning. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but they cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so long we trust in them. O house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. The Lord make you increase, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word to us. And again, we'll pray for a moment just as we turn back to his word. Heavenly Father, we again seek your help. We pray that uh, you would draw near to us as we take a few moments and meditate upon your word. We confess, Lord, that we uh, are very much in need. Uh, we are not able to see, we are not able to hear. We're not able to speak without the, the help of the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that the same Holy Spirit who inspired these words to be written would be at work in our hearts, uh, enabling us to, to see and hear and understand. And we pray that you would work within our hearts in such a way as to give us faith so that we would respond to your word by placing our trust in you and seeking to glorify your name because we confess, Lord, and we acknowledge, Lord, we rejoice, Lord, in the fact that you are worthy of all our praise. You are worthy of all glory. So hear us, help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles open, where you are, please, at Psalm 114 and Psalm 115, and then we'll take a, a few moments and and meditate upon uh, these psalms. Over the, the last few days, I think it's fair to say that all of us have had uh, a bit more, in fact, probably a lot more time uh, on our hands and, and a lot more time together uh, if we're uh, living together as families. And the other night in our house, the girls, they wanted to, to look back through some, some old pictures. So we, we dug uh, them out. We connected up this old hard drive that I hadn't seen for, for, for a lot of years and we, we started looking through these old photographs. And you know how it is with old pictures. Uh, you look at one, you may not have seen it for, for many, many years, but instantly when you see the picture you're, you're transported back uh, to the place 
that you once have been. Uh, you, you remember uh, and you, you revisit the experiences that you once had. You, you, you think about the people that you spent time with. Pictures do that for us. They trigger a lot in our minds and our, in our hearts and our emotions. And Psalm 114, which is where we begin, is a, it's like a picture. It's a, it's a collage even of, of, of where God's people had been in difficult days uh, and how God had, had saved them and delivered them and how God had, had cared for his people in some of the most trying times. And just like we may take out the same pictures uh, every year on certain significant dates and, and pour over them and, and relive memories. God's people, every year, at the time of Passover, they would, they would take out these pictures, they would take out uh, these psalms, the set of psalms from 113 to, to 118, and they would be reminded once more of, of who God is and what God had, had done for them over the years. So I'd like to look at two of these psalms today, if possible. First of all, we look at Psalm 114. Uh, and in Psalm 114, we see the, the power of God. And that's the first point, just two points today. First of all, as we look at the whole of Psalm 114, we see the power of God. And it's a psalm that begins in, in Egypt, but, but it begins more accurately, as we see in verse 1, with, with God's people who are coming out of Egypt. They're coming out of a, of a land, of a place uh, that was foreign to them. That's the, the story of, of, of verse 1. But the question that we, that we must ask as we, as we come to this psalm is, uh, well, what were they doing? What were God's people doing in Egypt in the first place? And we know from a wider reading of Scripture that they, they weren't in Egypt on a holiday. They weren't in Egypt on any kind of field trip or excursion. They were in captivity. They were prisoners. They were enslaved. Uh, they were suffering. And they were in and of themselves powerless to do anything about it. So actually before we see the power of God here in this psalm, we need to realise that the power of God is set against the backdrop of the powerlessness of God's people. God's people, Israel or uh, Judah, there's the two names used there, uh, which speaks about the whole uh, of the nation. Uh, God's people, uh, they were held captive by Egyptian armed forces, which were considerable in might, and certainly more powerful than they were. And God's people, they were held captive, even by the geography of the place that they were in, uh, the Red Sea, and the mountain range which were surrounding them stood between them and any hope of, of freedom. And they were powerless to change that. So that was, that was their Egypt experience. The sun begins with Egypt. And that was their Egypt experience. It was dark. Uh, they were in captivity. Uh, they were in difficulty. And they were powerless to change that. And it strikes me that sometimes we have to go through our own Egypt type experiences to come to terms with how powerless we are. You know, maybe this lockdown that we're currently going through is, is one such experience. I mean, nobody likes the circumstances we're in today. We don't like the fact that we're not able to, to meet together as a congregation in our, in our church building. Uh, we, we feel a, a sense of captivity, many of us, uh, in our own homes at this time. And perhaps the, the overwhelming sense that we have is, is this feeling of powerlessness. We can't do anything to change this in our own, in our own strength. We can't push back this coronavirus that seems to be sweeping our nation. We can't find a cure at the moment, as far as I understand. There seems to be so many obstacles, and there's a tangible sense of, 
of powerlessness every time we, we switch on the news and, and that's not comfortable. We're not living at present through an experience which is comfortable. But sometimes we actually learn a lot when we're in a state of discomfort. Uh, sometimes uh, we are uh, brought to learn a lot when we're reminded of our own weakness. And sometimes to be in that position can be a good thing. Because when we know our weakness, we are all the more ready to cry out to the God who is powerful. And he is powerful. That's the, the, the thrust, is the whole thrust of this psalm. When Israel were en route out of Egypt in verse 1, and the Red Sea stood between them and freedom, and the Egyptian armies were in pursuit of them as they sought to make their, their exit, their exodus out of Egypt, God's people, as they approached the sea, there was, there was no way through for them. They were terrified, we're told, in, in Exodus 14.10. So they cried out to the Lord. And what happened next? Well, God intervened. And we're told that as God's people approached the sea, the Red Sea, which stood between them and that place that God would have them go to, uh, the sea looked and fled. God miraculously, he, he inexplicably, Push the sea back. Such is God's power. And you can read the whole account of that in, in Exodus chapter 13 and uh, Exodus chapter 14. We have no time to go there just now. But that's the first snapshot. It's the first picture that we're given of God's power. He pushes back the Red Sea to allow his people to, to travel through to the place that he would have them be. And in the second picture, as we continue to, to focus on verse 3, it takes us 40 years forward in time. And the, the position that we find ourselves in uh, at this point is that God's people who had been led out of Egypt, who had been uh, led through the, the, the Red Sea, and who were in the wilderness en route to the Promised Land, they're now on the threshold of the Promised Land, but they couldn't enter it. Because the mile wide, fast-flowing Jordan River stood between them and this land that God had promised. Again, they, they felt powerless. Again, they, they were at a loss to know what to do. So what happened next? Well, they looked to God. They, they prayed, we're told, uh, that they consecrated themselves in Joshua 3. And God heard it. God intervened on their behalf and the Jordan which stood between them and the land that God had promised it turned back the, the river turned back again we can't understand it we don't have any scientific explanation uh, to, to explain it it's a supernatural powerful act of God and again, you can read of the whole story in Joshua chapter 3, but the, the message that comes through these two, these two pictures of verse 3, and indeed the message that comes through the whole of the psalm, is that our God is powerful. He's able to speak a word. And we're told in verse 7, creation trembles. Mountains, verse 6, are moved, they shake. He speaks a word and even the sea and the rushing waters, they are forced to obey. Because our God is powerful. And when we think about these images, when we think about uh, these uh, pictures that were given in this psalm, I think we, we begin to see Jesus appear. Because our minds uh, go to places like Mark 4. We see parallels there. Jesus and his disciples are in the boat. 
in the Sea of Galilee. And we're told in Mark 4.37, a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping in a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And that was a, it, it was a, a good question for the disciples to be asking. It was a sensible question for the disciples to be asking. How was it, they were thinking, that, that Jesus was able, with a word, to, to push back the waves of the sea and make everything calm? As we see in Mark 4. And if we continued on a, on a short journey through Mark, we could ask the question in Mark 5, how was it that Jesus was able, with a word, to push back legions of demons and bring peace to a soul? And if we were to, to do a tour of, of, of all of the Gospels, uh, we could ask the question, as the disciples likely did, how was it that Jesus was able, with a word, to push back any virus, or any disease, or any illness, any condition that was attacking uh, the people who came to him? How could he do it? And if we go forward a little more, we must ask the question, how was it that when Jesus went to the cross, he was able to push back sin and Satan and death and hell and bring salvation and true freedom and abundant eternal life to all who believe in him? How does he have that power to save? And the answer is because he is God. He is God the Son. And we see the power of God. Not only in this psalm as God deals with the nation of Israel, but we see the power of God in an incredible way in and through Christ. And the question we must ask at this point is how should we respond to this powerful God? And the answer, according to Psalm 114, is we should tremble before him. That's what we're taught in this psalm, in verse 7. That's even what the creation teaches us to do. Verse 7, tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. And some might say, shouldn't this, uh, shouldn't this today be a message of, of peace and a message of comfort in these scary times? Uh, uh, not a message that's designed to make us tremble. Well, I would counter that by saying this is a message of peace. But if we want real peace and not some poor imitation, imitation, if we want God's peace, if we want deep peace, real peace, if we want God's salvation, if we want his help, if we want his healing, then we need to humble ourselves. We need to accept, as we see in, in verse 2, that he as the powerful God has, has dominion over us. We need to realize our own powerlessness to save ourselves and then cry out to God as Israel did. Our God, he is 
He is mighty to save. Our God is, is powerful and he uses his great power not to, to crush his people but to save his people. He uses his great power to care for his people. And that's where this psalm closes. Uh, we see that in the closing verses when Israel are in the wilderness on this journey to the promised land and uh, on the route at this point they have no water they have no means of getting water they are distressed uh, they are fearful but what did God do? Well, verse 8 tells us that he turned the rock into a pool the hard rock into springs of water you can read the whole story of that in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20. But the point that has been made here is that this powerful God is tender. He is attentive to his people. He knows our needs. And he cares for us. So in a time where there is so much worry and so much concern, what are we to do? Well, Peter answers that question in 1 Peter 5 and in verse 7. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And surely that's a great comfort for us to know that this powerful God he knows about the coronavirus. He, he knows uh, about Russian warships in the North Sea. He, he knows about the concerns that we may have for our business. He knows about the worries that we have over our loved ones. He knows about even all the small details that keep us awake at night. And he promises that he will care for us. And if we know that, surely with the psalmist we want to, we want to praise him. Surely we want to, to glorify his name. And that's the note of the next psalm. And I want very briefly to step through the next psalm. And the first psalm is given the title, uh, the, the, the Power of God. If we see the power of God in Psalm 114, uh, the, the next psalm here, Psalm 115, we could give the title uh, to uh, that psalm as, as Glory to God. Because that's the call of the psalm. It's a, it's a call to glorify God. It's a call to glorify God. Not self, not idols, but it's a call to, to bring glory to God. And I want to, to just ask the question, a very practical question. How do we glorify God with our lives? And I want to suggest four uh, answers to that question as we follow the course of the psalm. The first thing we do if we want to glorify God is we, we tell him. Which I suppose is another way of saying we, we give him praise. And that's the, the, the tone of verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. So as the people of God in this situation, as the us of verse 1 uh, unite their voices, who are they speaking to? Well, they're, they're speaking to God. The psalm, it's a, it's a song, it's a song of praise, it's a, it's a prayer, and it's directed first and foremost to God. They tell God that he is worthy of all glory because of who he is, because of, of what he's done, because of all the, the acts of, of, of love and faithfulness that they, that they remembered here on here. So what are we taught through this verse by way of application? Well, uh, we are taught very straightforwardly here that in order for us to glorify God, we are to, we are to praise him from our hearts with our, our mouths as we, as we sing uh, and as we pray. 
as we express audibly the fact that he is worthy. And as I said in the, in the children's talk, to glorify God is, a, is our reason for living. Why would he do? The Shorter Catechism uh, says in question one, what is man's chief end? And the answer comes back, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And, and let's know that. Our, our chief end, our, our primary purpose, our whole reason for living, it's not to, to binge on, on Netflix box sets. And I think probably people on lockdown have probably had enough of that already. Our primary reason for being here, our chief end is, is not to buy more stuff, because what's the point of buying more stuff if we can't even just now go outside and use it or wear it? A reason for living is not to, to make more money, because what's the point of making money if we've nowhere to, to buy stuff? It's not all about our work, because most of us aren't working just now. It's not about the next holiday of God because all these holidays have been cancelled. It's not all about sport. Sport is done for now. And so much of what we've given our lives over to has been taken away from us or rendered meaningless almost overnight. And I would ask him the question, why are we here? Everything about our lives almost has changed, and we're asking the question, why are we here? And according to Psalm 115, we are here to glorify the God who made us, and who in a sense lost us to sin as we turned away from him. And yet, the God who saved us through Christ at such great cost. So let us be encouraged to join our voices in, in prayer and in, in praise with the psalmist. Let us, from our hearts, with our lips, tell the Lord, maybe for the first time as we trust him, or maybe for the first time in a long time if we've wandered away from him, let us tell him that he is worthy of all glory and all praise. How do we glorify God with our lives? We, we tell him that he is worthy. The second thing we do here is, is we throw our idols. And sometimes that's when we need a bit of time and space to realise what our, our idols are. Our Archbishop William Temple, a uh, minister the Church of England in, in the last century uh, said, he said this, when you don't have to think of anything, when your mind hasn't been taken to think by the environment, where does your mind go? What does your mind habitually go to? What do you most like to think about? What do you most enjoy daydreaming about? What gives you the most comfort to fantasize about? That's the question he asks. And then he follows up by saying, that's your God. Your religion is what you do with your solitude. And maybe for us in the solitude of, of lockdown, maybe in this stillness, in this solitude, the one true God has been showing us some of the other small g gods that we allow to come into our lives. Maybe in the solitude of lockdown, uh, the one true God has been showing us some of the idols that we cling on to. Sometimes we think of idols as, as statues and golden monuments, but uh, as Tim Keller says, anything more important to you than the, than the real God is an alternative God, an idol. What does the psalmist have to say about idols? Well, to, to paraphrase verses 4 to 8, he says, Idols, they're a load of rubbish. The idols, verse 4, are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. 
eyes but they cannot see, ears but they cannot hear, noses but they cannot smell, they have hands but they cannot feel, feet but they cannot walk, nor can they utter a sign with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Again, Kelly says, idols have no power, verses 5 and 7, to give you the love, forgiveness and guidance you need. But paradoxically, they do have the power to make you like them, verse 8. William Duncan, a minister of the state, says, you become like what you worship. And if you worship an idol which is nothing, you will become empty and vain and be brought to nothing. So what should we do with the idols that the Lord shows us we have allowed to come into our lives? Well, I'll tell you what we should do with them. We should do the same with them as we do with all rubbish. We should do the same to them as what we do with all empty packages, all worthless things. We throw them away. We can't glorify God with our lives and, and keep hold of idols, so we need to throw them out. And in these last few days, as we've gone into the isolation, I think many of the idols that we that we cling on to actually have been prized out of our hearts. God has, at least for a period, thrown them away for us. And that can be painful, but we should be thankful for them. And we should be careful should this virus pass and should life uh, go back to some kind of normal for us, we should be careful not to pick these idols back up, whatever these idols may be. William Cowper said in the, the great hymn that we often sing, the dearest idol I have known, whatever the idol be, help me to tear it from my throne and worship only thee. How do we, how do we glorify God with our lives when we tell him and we praise him? How do we glorify God with our lives when we, we throw out the idols that he convicts us of as he shines his light into our lives? The third thing here is we, we glorify God by trusting him. And from verses 9 to 11, it's as if the, the psalmist, he turns the volume up to max and three times with great emphasis, we are exhorted to and we are given reasons to trust the Lord. Verse 9, O, o house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. Verse 10, O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, verse 11, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. And you might say, well, that's easy for the, for the psalmist to say. Uh, he didn't have a, a pandemic to worry about when he was writing this. He probably had an easy life. He, he was probably in a good place just having had some, some victory and, uh, and on the high of that victory. But that's what the commentators are, are mainly agreed uh, that this was a difficult time for God's people when the psalm was written. God's people were struggling. The nations were sneering. Verse 2, the, the nations were, were saying to God's people, where is their God? And yet the psalmist, he keeps his eye on God. He, he remembers what we need to remember, that the God is, is sovereign. He is, he is in control. Our God, verse 3, is, is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. And the psalmist, he believes that, he trusts that, he keeps on trusting the Lord. And if you and I want to know God's blessing, the blessing that we get a flavour of in verses 12 to, to 15, if you and I want to live lives that are, are glorifying God, we need to keep on trusting Him. We need to keep hold of that threefold promise that we have in these verses, that He is our help and shield. We need to know that. We need to believe that. We need to trust that. Even in, and, and actually especially in, difficult times. How do we glorify God? We 
care of them when we face them. Uh, we throw our idols. We trust the Lord. And finally, we tell others about the Lord. And that's how the psalm uh, concludes. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth is given to man. Not the dead who praise the Lord, it's those who go down to silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forever more. Praise the Lord. And you know, the message there, uh, as we finish, it's, it's clear. On earth, uh, we have a mission. We have, if we are God's people, if we are trusting in them, we, we have a great commission. And it's to tell people about the Lord Jesus. You know, people have had enough uh, bad news over these last few days. I saw a post on, on social media just a couple of days back. It was one of these messages that goes out on a, on a timeline to, to everybody. And, and, and the message said this. It said, I'm tired of seeing coronavirus posts. I want to see your answers. Then there were some questions, and I thought to myself as I glanced at these are these are likely to be profound questions. And here's the questions, or the first few of them. Number one, what's your favourite pie? Number two, how old are you? Number three, how many tattoos do you have? Number four, have you ever ice skated? And I just struck me so forcibly that at a time like this when yes we are very much rocked by the reality of bad news at a time like this when there is a sense of fear and when there is a sense of powerlessness how hopeless we are if all we have to say is what's your favourite pie? How many tattoos have you got? How futile it is if our only counter to the darkness of the coronavirus is, is, to, is to start answering these kind of questions. You know, people don't need to know about my favourite pie. They don't need to know about your tattoos. They don't need to know how old you are and they don't need to know about your ability or inability to ice skate. But people do need to know the truth about Jesus. People need to know the good news about the Lord Jesus. And if we are trusting him, if we are his people, it's our job to tell them. So let us be encouraged and challenged to talk less about Corona and to talk more about Christ. Let us be encouraged to tell others about the Lord Jesus, about his sinless life that he lived for us because we couldn't live it, about his sacrificial death which he died in our place for our sins and about his glorious resurrection and the eternal life that he promises to share with us if we believe in him. Tell others about Jesus and may souls be saved and may God be glorified as we seek to do so. Heavenly Father, help us, we pray, as we meditate upon these sermons, to be, to tremble before your power, to be in awe at your majesty, and yet, Lord, to be uh, almost overwhelmed with the magnitude of your grace and your care for us and of us. And enable us, Lord, we pray, to trust you. And enable us, we pray, to, to give our lives over, not to seeking to glorify ourselves, uh, not to, to, to seek to, to bring other gods into our lives, but help us, we pray, 
to hear, O Lord, uh, to seek him, to glorify you. Because you alone are worthy. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. We will conclude now by saying to God's praise uh, from the hymn, uh, the well known hymn, uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross, in which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt in all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crime, where the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all.
and now in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore.